160. He's gone. What's up guys? Welcome back to the garage and today we're going to be doing a comparison, review and tear down of a Harbor Freight 4.5 inch angle grinder. Now currently Harbor Freight offers three different models for a 4.5 inch angle grinder. Uh, the first is El Cheapo which is your most basic one rated officially online at 4.3 amps and uh, costs about $14 without a coupon, $11 with a coupon. The next level is your professional series Harbor Freight Angle Grinder, uh, which retails for about $21, has 4.5 amps, uh, and can be had with a coupon for $17. And the third one is a 6 amp paddle switch one, and I don't have one of those, so we're not going to be talking about it, but that's about $32. Uh, and I've never seen a coupon for that, so other than the standard 20%. Now, this guy over here I had for about two years and it finally burnt up, and so we're actually going to take it apart and see which bearing inside of it failed uh, and what we could have done to kind of prevent that. Now, more importantly, we're going to compare these two. This is about a year old professional series one. Um, that is clearly much more heavy duty than this, which is a brand new professional series one. I've had this for a month or two. And so we're going to see the differences between these two um, in terms of specifications and motors and construction. And I'm going to show you guys why this kind of sucks. Because this older uh, professional series unit will run for a long time without ever getting hot, whereas the new ones get really, really hot to the touch. And to be honest with you, that's my biggest complaint about uh, the Harbor Freight grinders is if you're not wearing a glove and you're doing like grinding where you're like grinding for more than a minute in a row, um, it gets actually hot enough to like burn your hand uh, and become very uncomfortable. You have to take it away. But we're gonna we're gonna get in all that. Uh, boilerplate disclaimer: I bought all of these with my own money. Um, I don't have any sort of sponsorship from Harbor Freight, so I am not going to be biased in any way. Um, I also don't have like a fundamental problem with Chinese tools. Uh, I use a lot of their products both electric and otherwise here in the garage and for kind of the everyday man that likes to do projects and stuff uh, I find that a lot of the stuff that they sell is is really more than adequate. So with that said let's first start by uh, by doing a little comparo, moving here to the bench and doing a little comparison uh, between the three units. Okay, so first of all, let's start with taking a look at the labels on these various uh, Harbor Freight machines. So this is their cheapo four and a half angle, uh, four and a half inch angle grinder. Uh, we have a five eighths by eleven uh, spindle. This shows four point three amps, sixty hertz, one hundred twenty volts, and ten thousand RPMs. Uh, if we look at the old school professional model, this guy claims to have a 5 8 by 11 spindle, 120 volts, but 4.5 amps at 11,000 RPMs. So this spins, this has uh, 2 tenths of an amp more capacity and spins uh, 1,000 RPMs faster. And now if we look at this guy, which is the uh, newer professional model, this also claims 11,000 ripums at 5 amps. Uh, with the same 5 8 by 11 TPI spindle. So I'm going to set this guy aside for a minute and we're going to uh, take it apart here in a second. But I want to show you the comparison between these two professional models. So the first obvious difference right, is the switch placement. I really like this switch uh, and the reason I really like this switch on top is because when I'm doing heavy grinding it's almost always a two hand approach. So that way, I, I, I never hold like this, right? You don't, you don't grind like that, it's awkward. You put your hand like this and put your thumb right on the switch so you can grind, 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 pop it off. As opposed to the design that the cheaper units have and this new professional model, I'm gonna take this handle off here for a second just so you guys can see everything a little better. It has it on the side. And the other thing I don't like is this has this weird push lock unlock thing where it locks like that and then you push it like that and it unlocks. This is just a standard switch. It's either on or off. I don't like this self-locking. I understand it's a safety mechanism, but honestly when I'm when I'm working on stuff, 
and this is bouncing around, right? This tends to pop off, and I don't like that. You can see the body's a little different as well. Um, right here, if, I, if you focus on these, you can see that the quality of the casting is kind of different. Um, if we look at the side, this is also made out of the same shitty kind of casting. You can tell that this is this is made out of uh, uh, this is a better casting and it's made out of a kind of a heavier duty material. This has much bigger uh, fan blades. If you look in here, you can see that the fan blades are in fact metal on this one. They're plastic on here. The lockout button here is literally a straight metal pin, and so the chances of it breaking are pretty slim. This has the same cheapo style um, lockout pin that has this plastic cap on it, which is prone to breaking. And so if you compare these two, you can see that what they've done is they've basically taken the cheaper model, put a red body on it, and then called it the professional line, which I really don't like. Now, while both of these use a brushed motor, and this one cla claims to be five amps, uh, whereas this one is uh, four and a half, this has, you can see there's these two nubs right here. And what these are inside of here, and I'll get a screwdriver and show you guys in a second, is this has removable brushes. And generally when it comes to professional grade equipment, and I use the term professional kind of loosely, um, you want to have removable brushes because then it's simply click, click, take the old brushes out, put a new set in. I can get hours and hours out of the grinder if you're using it in a setting where you're using it every day for extended periods of time. The other thing is, is this one, like its cheapo predecessor, gets super hot in the hand. Whereas this one always remains cool and I can actually grind barehanded and I know that's a big safety no-no. But the point is I can hold this in my hand and run it uh, for basically as long as I want <clears throat> without uh, kind of burning or hurting my hand. So I've been running this uh, for about a minute just polishing this surface and you can see this is the uh, kind of ambient air temperature and if we put this right here you can see this piece of plastic is already over 100 degrees, 102, 105. So I mean this this plastic body is approaching 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Like this right here where my finger is is already painful. Like I'm removing my hand because it's it hurts. Okay, so like a minute ago this topped out at 150. I started screwing around with it. So this this part right here gets down gets up to 150 degrees to me if I grab it this bottom part is even hotter and I mean like I can't I can't even hold this I any mean, like I can hold it up here but up here where the motor is can't can't touch that at all now for comparison's sake I did the same thing with this guy and the temperature out here only got up to about hundred and five degrees Fahrenheit so what that means is that this is either much better insulated than this guy is or that this guy is um, getting a lot more cooling because it's got those metal fans in there. But what I was going to show you guys earlier is that if we just like take a set of scissors, and this is definitely not the right way to do it, but uh, pop this out right here, pop this cap out. Underneath it, there is our brush. And these brushes are easy to replace and it makes it very convenient and when I bought this one along with some of my other professional grade uh, Harbor Freight tools they come with an extra set of brushes uh, immediately in the packaging and so you can really run this for quite a while and then uh, just swap out your brushes and keep right on going if you need to but yeah to me this is this is a very this is a real high quality tool I actually really like this one a lot and when uh, this guy died, I went to go buy another professional series one. I ended up with this, and I'm definitely much less happy about that. So that's kind of a uh, comparison. In terms of review, this is an excellent angle grinder. If you can still find these uh, somewhere else, maybe from a different manufacturer, with the uh, metal vent fins and the uh, brushes that come out the side with the top button, I would gladly pay another 20 bucks and get another couple of these uh, without a doubt. Now, initially I was going to run this one until you guys could hear the bearing chatter. 
But uh, then I remembered that that would really suck when I went to go take it apart because it would be super blistering hot. So you have to take my word for it that basically once this thing runs for like a minute with some sort of load on it, there's a bearing that starts screaming. And so what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to take it apart and see if we can't find that bearing. Obviously our power cord is unplugged. Uh, in the back we just have one screw and that's all that kind of holds this rear casing on apparently. Slide that off the back. And back here you saw how on the, uh, the other one there were removable brushes. On this unit the brushes are not removable. Um, or at least not obviously so because you can see right there they are uh, they're riveted in and so basically once the brushes burn out on this unit that's it this is your switch mechanism it uh, sits back here and basically it pushes down there's a little pin right in there um, and when so when you push it forward it just pulls down the downside of this is you got this kind of flimsy piece right here and it can slip off but the, uh, the momentary switch itself that's back here feels actually pretty good. And so the way it works is it only works when it's compressed so it automatically shoots back out um, to make it safe. So that's kind of the rear of the motor. There's our brushes. Uh, so now we can kind of take apart this, this head unit with the uh, gear assembly. So there's four screws here on the front. And that just comes off as one unit and you can see there's our um, our worm gear and this stuff that appears to sort of be grease uh, this is this cheap Chinese grease and it's quite possibly why it failed it doesn't seem like it's this bearing that failed because it's spinning quite nicely but I'm gonna get some tools and we're gonna take this apart real quick so first of all in here there's just a little baby snap ring, underneath it there's a, a wave washer, there we go, that's basically just a compression tool to make sure everything stays shut. After that we can slide off uh, this gear right here, and the gear itself actually looks to be in pretty good shape, uh, I'm not seeing any chatter marks on the teeth. Uh, you can definitely tell by the wear pattern. It's right on the outside of the gear, so that's probably not ideal. You really want kind of a, a more even wear pattern. But considering I paid $14 or something like that for this, uh, or less, I'm sorry, less, like $10. There's a little woodruff key that uh, locks this gear to the shaft. Bunch more of this shitty Chinese cancer grease. And so if we take a look in here, you can see scar marks on the outside of the bearing and the GoPro is probably going to do a better job of capturing this than the uh, the main camera. Here, you can see scar marks on the outside of the bearing and the GoPro is probably going to do a better job of capturing this than the, uh, the main camera. The bearing is a DUF 6000Z. And yeah, this bearing looks to be in pretty good shape. It's a little tiny bearing, but it's uh, it's pretty fat, so it's got a pretty decent uh, size roller bearings for what it is, actually. And so it it probably stood up okay. So we can basically just set the stuff aside and go a little bit further in our exploration of this tool. So if we go back here to the head, if you look inside the head, you can see there's a, uh, a bunch more of this kind of Chinese cancer grease. They really uh, pack it in pretty good for, for 10 bucks. Um, down in here you have a little receiver hole, a, uh, a metal divot, and what this divot does is when you push this to lock, that's what that divot is. And what it does is it falls into one of two holes on the back of this uh, gear. And what that allows you to do is lock the head so you can screw and unscrew tools. And then down in here you can see our, uh, our other worm gear. And there's quite a bit of play in it. Almost, I would say, uh, an eighth of an inch of play. And that's directly connected to, uh, to our motor. So to remove the rest of this head assembly, there's just four more uh, 
Phillips screws. And so this is part of what I don't like about the design. You have this kind of plastic um, cooling fins that don't work very well. And there's a little dust cover in here that comes out. And let me uh, quickly finish disassembling this. There's two more, uh, two more long Phillips screws in here. And this should allow us to remove uh, this internal assembly. Wires that kind of held all this in place simply just popped right out um, that or attached to the coils. In here, I'm pretty sure it's actually this head bearing in here that failed. You can't really hear it on the camera, but there's, uh, there's quite a bit of wobble. And this gear slides all the way forward and starts to chatter. And I'm pretty sure that's actually what, uh, what kind of did us in in combination with the heat. Now, <clears throat> This assembly should in fact be removable. It looks like there's two more screws in there, but you have to get this plastic piece off first. Um, and I don't really see much of a reason to fuck with it at this point because we've disassembled it all the way. But uh, our rotor looks to be in good condition. There's definitely some wear marks uh, right here that look like they were machined out. I don't, I don't know if that was actually caused by it, uh, it hitting something or if those are just, just wear marks. But basically what happens is inside an electric motor, electricity is passed through the brushes here and it makes contact and it constantly switches the uh, magnetic polarity which causes this to repel against this stator which doesn't move and so it's like repulse magnet, repulse magnet, repulse magnet and causes it to spin at a certain speed and uh, it's really a pretty good fit in there, it's uh, fairly tight. Um, like I said, these wires are, are encased, but not very well. Um, it's fairly cheap, but then again, you know, I paid 10 bucks for this thing, so it's pretty good for $10 for two years. You've got another DUF uh, 607Z back here, so all the bearings are enclosed, which is fairly nice touch. So my guess is, is the, the bearing that failed is the one that's in here and if I were to spin this up again and get it nice and hot, my guess is what happens is this gets hot in here and then it seizes because what would happen is the motor would spin but the head wouldn't uh, transfer any torque. So that's probably what, what did us in here. But yeah, if you watch channels like Avi or AVE, whatever you want to call them, um, you'll see he takes apart more higher end tools. Uh, but the truth is on the inside you're going to find a lot of the same stuff that you find inside this cheap little Harbor Freight and Like I said the biggest issue I think that they have is is cooling and if I can get my hands on some of those um, Metal cooled uh, Grinders like the uh, professional grade unit that I have I would be much much happier But all in all considering the uh, price paid I would say this is this is a pretty good tool I got two years out of it so I'm pretty happy with it uh, all in all in terms of, you know, value for money, if you will. But, yeah, you can see this has a lot of heat scarring on it. And so that this internal head assembly is kind of kind of what ends up failing where, uh, where these gears are. Ooh. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. So you can see right there, this shaft is really scarred as well. Um, so that's kind of our root cause for failure. But if you need a cheap grinder for $10, please don't hesitate to buy one from Harbor Freight. Just realize it's probably not gonna last you, you know, till the end of your life. Uh, and some people like to buy tools like that, I don't. Um, a $10 grinder that lasts two years is better than a $200 grinder that lasts me the rest of my life because I don't know how much grinding I'm gonna do and I like to have, you know, three or four of these things with different attachments so I can quickly swap in and out and three or four $200 grinders is going to put you close, you know, to 800 bucks, which is a colossal amount of money for fucking grinders. Whereas I can get four of these for 50 bucks, let's say. And even if I have to swap them out every couple of years, it's fine. The uh, professional grade ones is with the removable brushes. If you can find them, that is what you want. Uh, I've had that one, like I said, for about a year and a half, and I don't think it'll ever fail. Or, uh, you know, just from general use. And that's the one that gets used the hardest because it has the grinding wheel or uh, the uh, flap disc on it. So, thanks for watching this video. Make sure you check me out on Instagram at MaxWorks. Uh, you can send me a Snapchat at MaxWorks. I do my best to answer questions for, for those who snap. 
Facebook backslash MaxWorks, all that good stuff. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. Peace.